let's talk about the history of the atom. We're going to start first by talking about the periodic table. Back in the early 1800s, Johann Doberreiner came up with something known as the law of triads. And simply stated, the law of triads was simply the observation that there were certain elements, a set of three elements per group that had similar chemical properties to each other. And the list wasn't fully comprehensive, but if you look at the periodic table as we know it now, what um, Johann observed was that calcium, strontium, and barium, which now we know lie on group two of the periodic table, had similar properties to each other. And the same happened with sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. They behave in a very similar manner as each other, and they happen to be in the same group. And chloride, bromide, iodide were the other three elements that also behaved similarly in respect to each other. So this was kind of an early observation that, yeah, there was some periodicity associated with certain groups of elements. But there were other groups of three elements that they kind of behave as such, but they didn't quite fit the criteria. So there were inconsistencies present at the time. And so this was more like an observation, but not a rule because of the inconsistencies. So, you know, fast forward about, you know, 30 years later, more like 25, I suppose, but um, here is Mayer. Um, in fact, this is young Mayer and old Mayer. <laughs> um, what he did is he arranged all the known elements of the time in an early version of the periodic table. And uh, he actually did this before Mendeleev came up with his table. Uh, the main difference was that the elements were arranged per row as opposed to columns. So the table looked more like this. It was almost like the periodic table, um, you know, rotated 90 degrees on its axis. But um, the thing about the mayor table and the reason why you don't hear much about him when discussions of periodic table, you know, are brought forward is that he never went as far as being able to predict elements, even though his table wasn't all that far off from the, the main table. Also, if you look carefully, you realize that there were some um, some issues with where the transition metals, so titanium, vanadium, chromium, zirconium. Um, you know, he placed them in here based on their masses, and they sort of like were showing some type of similarities, but they, there were some inconsistencies, something that didn't quite make it um, make it right, and so because of that. Um, this table never really got its uh, its full um, recognition. And Mayer, you know, you probably haven't even heard of him in the past, but technically he's the first one that started like arranging the elements in groups and coming together with some type of um, some type of logical arrangement for them. But then let's see, five years later, okay, so five years later, Mendeleev now comes up with an early version of the periodic table that looks closer to the one that we know of right now. He arranges the elements in columns and um, he does something uh, that Mayer didn't do. He actually uses his table to predict elements that didn't um, exist or weren't known at the time. And he goes farther than just predicting that they would exist. Using his periodic table and the knowledge of the physical properties of the known elements at the time, he made predictions based on where they should fall in the periodic table and how they compared to the other groups that were known at the time. And with those predictions, he was able to tell that the element would be of a certain color, that it would have a certain look to it. Uh, its melting point would be roughly in the vicinity of certain values. And to astonishing results, he was able to predict the properties almost to, uh, you know, mind-blowing accuracy. Uh, now the only problem with the Mendeleev table is that some of the elements, specifically the transition metals once again, weren't exactly arranged in the proper order. But the fact that he was able to predict elements that weren't known at the time with such level of accuracy is what ultimately landed Mendeleev with the title of the father of the periodic table because he 
not only arranged the elements in that order, but he used that table to ultimately make chemical predictions. And ultimately, going beyond just collecting the data is what counts in science. And so that's why Mendeleev gets uh, proper recognition for it. But the transition metals are still massively stable. They're not properly arranged. You know, you have certain cells that actually contain two elements present in them and you know so this is not the best table uh it's definitely not the final version of the table for sure uh, in addition to that um there are some elements that are still missing in mendeley's table specifically the, the noble gases helium neon argon krypton xenon and radon uh, these elements didn't appear until you know 30 years later than when the life stable you know came to be and um, these elements were found by Lord Riley and Ramsey and so um, these two scientists in fact uh, um, Riley you know was the old advisor of Ramsey so this is like uh, the master and the pupil right but they both made certain contributions so Riley was able to isolate argon uh, Ramsey, on the other hand, he isolated and discovered helium and radon, which were a little bit harder to to isolate. So in my opinion, that's even more impressive than, than Riley's you know, isolation of argon. But the two together um, are credited with finding neon, krypton, and xenon. So all the, no the noble gases, which is an entire column in the periodic table that wasn't there to begin with, with the Mendeley table, is added as a result of the work. And... Um, the table isn't exactly yet finished, but before we can get to the final end of the table, we have to talk about some elementary particles and some of the studies that were happening at the time, right? This is kind of entering into the early 20th century. And some new advancements in physics and chemistry, in terms of theory, begin to take shape. All right, so one of the things that ends up happening at the very end of the 19th century is that Thomson sets up a tube. This tube has metal electrodes on both ends. And so if, if you connect a negative end and the positive end of an electrode and pass electricity through this tube, uh, the tube itself here doesn't have any connections. All it has is a partially evacuated chamber with some gas particles in it. But the connection of the voltage allows um, a, an electrode potential difference high enough in potential to be present on both ends of the tubes to such an extent that you end up forming this ray of light, a ray of light which in fact um, is susceptible to magnetic fields. As you can see here, this person has a, mag a magnet approaching one end of the tube and the ray actually deflects as a result of the presence of the magnetic field. Now the tube itself is known as the cathode discharge tube. And as I mentioned before, it does have inside gas of uh, under low pressures you have a positive and negative potential terminal and the rate emerges when you hook hook them up to the um, to the source now the ray is known as the cathode rate and in due time uh, it was found that it's actually composed of elementary particles known as the electrons the electrons uh, themselves are now present in all of matter and the reason why we come with a conclusion is because after all what you have in the tube is elements gases of different kinds and it could be any type of different uh, noble gas or any other gas and regardless of the identity of the gas you get the same ray coming out the moment the potentials are you know added to both ends of the tube so this kind of seems to suggest that all of matter is composed of electrons not entirely true but from the point of view of chemicals that is relatively true now the electron is a particle that has a few characteristics characteristics that ultimately Thomson uh, decided to go after and the first one was trying to find out what the mass of the electron was what the charge of the electron would be and so what Thomson did is he set up the cathode ray tube within an inner compartment now this inner compartment had a big detector that will basically tell you where the electron was striking in relation to where the cathode uh, tube originated. And uh, 
right after, you know, like just after coming out of the cathode tube, the cathode ray was basically met by a plate of electric potential that could be changed at will uh, and for which the actual values of the potentials could be monitored relatively accurately. And a result of turning in the potentials here is that the electron will start deviating from the original path that it would take. And so looking at the deviation, the final striking end of the electron on the detector compared to where it should have been would tell you how much charge this electron could have. The only issue though is that in this cathode discharge to by Thomson, um, yes, the electron will move towards a positive plate and it will deviate, but as much as we would like to say that that was the, the story for telling you know what the masses and charges of the electron were, mm, you exactly couldn't. You could tell that because you were moving towards the positive end of this plate, the electrons have to be negatively charged. But unfortunately, the most you could get out of this particular experiment was the mass per charge ratio. Uh, that number is what Thomson obtained, the ratio of the mass per charge of the electron. And it wasn't until a different experiment, you know, now close to 1910, um, a different experiment set up by a different scientist. This is uh, Millikan's oil drop experiment. And as the name implies, you have an oil emuls emulsor that is um, applied into this chamber. Now this chamber is evacuated also, uh, but you immerse these uh, oil particles into the chamber and due to gravity, the particles, the oil particles are dispersed to start falling down. Some of them make it through this tiny aperture in the upper portion of the plates and they start falling down. And so what happens now is that the plates here that you see, the golden plates, uh, actually are set up that, so that you can manually, with a, the proper instrument, turn them into positive and negative potentials. And so the particles that have uh, developed, you no, know, that will develop negative charges as a result of the interaction with the X-rays that are basically being shined on the molecules falling down from the upper aperture down to this plate. Uh, the moment you turn on these plates with a charge, positive charge on the and negative charge on the bottom, um, the negatively charged particles start getting attracted towards the positive end of the plate. And if the overall positive charge and negative charge here are of just the right magnitude, the old particles will basically cease to fall. They will start free floating in, in air. And at that point, you would basically use the premise of the force of gravity having to be equal to the force of Coulombic attraction of charges. And ultimately from those two interactions, uh, Millikan uses his oil drop experiment to find out exactly what the charge of the electron is. So um, with this particular experiment, he finds out the charge of the electron. But the beauty of this is that not only does he find out that the charge of the electron is negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, but because Thomson had already determined the mass to charge ratio of the electron, the moment that Millikan finds out the charge of the electron, automatically he gets the mass of the electron too, with the aid of the value obtained by Thomson. So this is actually um, the set of experiments that ultimately give you the piece of information necessary about the electron. And needless to say, these values are pretty small, as they should be, because the electron is a very small, very, very tiny particle. All right, so then here's where some of the atomic theories start taking shape. Thomson looks at the fact that electrons have to be present in all of matter and says, well, okay, there are electrons in matter, but they do have a negative charge. So there has to be something inside of matter that has positive charge that counteracts the charge of the electron and fully cancels it out. And so he starts thinking that perhaps matter is composed of a membrane where these electrons are located and the membrane itself has positive charge permeating throughout it all. So he starts thinking, okay, so this could be the picture. You could have the electrons in this membrane and the membrane is just positive charge throughout. And due to the premise and the look of it, he decides to call it the plum pudding model of the atom. 
And for the longest time, I was wondering, why would you call it that? It seems like such a weird name. But I started looking into, okay, well, let's see how, what these plum puddings are. These are English desserts, by the way. Uh, and this one kind of looks like what we have right here, right? The, the pudding um, is, in essence, the membrane with a positive charge. And the plums that are, you know, inside the pudding itself, those are the electrons, right? And here you can see very clearly, it's like, okay, well, that definitely looks like the model that he was thinking of. And here you have even a much more appetizing uh, version of the plum pudding. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? I think I think <laughs> uh, Thompson had, you know, an okay idea with this plum pudding. You know, it's actually not too bad of an idea. Um, so this is now known as the plum pudding model. And here's where a few other theories come in to see whether the proposal by Thompson in terms of what the element is and what matter is start you know taking shape so in the next video i'm going to investigate and discuss with you um what extra experiments get done to prove or disprove the idea by thompson and ultimately lead to additional particles being present in the atom